In the fall of 2021, Thinkers Lodge, in partnership with the Center for Local Prosperity, are bringing together 30 leading voices from both the nuclear and climate crises for deep and brave conversations in an environment of intergenerational partnership. This summit examines the two major existential threats for humanity in our current age. In 1955, Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell drafted a manifesto for nuclear scientists to gather to discuss curbing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In 1957, the very first anti-nuclear meeting was held at the historic Thinker's Lodge in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. That pugwash movement continues today. The climate change issue, what we're confronting, it's impossible. It is beyond us. But then on the other hand, throughout history, the most interesting things have been in those moments in history when a people decided to do the impossible. And that's what we need to do now. And that's what we will do now. I'm Robert Cervelli, Executive Director for Center for Local Prosperity. Welcome to this webinar. We're going to have a one hour discussion as part of our Thinkers Lodge series um, for 2021. Uh, this webinar is the first in a three part set of discussions um, as part of our upcoming Thinkers Lodge Summit on nuclear and climate crises that'll be occurring at the end of September and early October. For that summit, we've gathered 24 thinkers regionally from across the four Atlantic Canadian provinces and internationally from as far as Moscow to Vancouver, who will take part both virtually and on site at the Thinkers Lodge from September 26th to October 3rd. The thinkers will be gathered to have deep and brave conversations about the two existential threats facing humanity today, the threat of nuclear war and the rapid and obviously increasing onset of the effects of climate change. So we'll be talking about both of those uh, tonight uh, with the upcoming webinars. There will be feature articles interviewing some of the thinkers as well. Uh, which we'll be putting out um, over the coming weeks. A little bit about the Thinker's Lodge. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to hold this summit and these discussions there, these deep and brave conversations uh, because of the history of Thinker's Lodge. It's a very powerful venue for this. It began in uh, the Cold War um, in the 1950s uh, with a manifesto that was put out by Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein uh, calling to curb um, and halt the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which were building up very quickly after World War II. Um, coming out of that manifesto at the invitation of Cyrus Eaton was the first Pugwash Conference in 1957 where some 24 nuclear physicists gathered from around the world, all the nuclear powers, and I should add great political risk uh, in those charged times. That work, uh, that conference continues today. Uh, in 1995, that work um, and the work of Joseph Rotblatt was awarded the 1995 Nobel Peace Prize, which is housed at the Thinker's Lodge. But there's chapters, Pugwash chapters around the world. There's workshops and conferences that continue annually. Um, and you'll be hearing more about that perhaps this evening. So it's our goal with this upcoming summit to interview all of the thinkers that we've invited, these distinguished leaders, either in a webinar format like today and feature articles, which uh, the first one we've just released or other formats. So pay attention to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and you can follow these in the coming weeks as they come out. 
It is my great privilege to have three of those thinkers here today, um, experts in both the nuclear weapons issue as well as climate change. Um, we are discussing this evening the threat of nuclear weapons, which have been with us, of course, since 1945 with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've seen dramatic stockpile buildup of weapons during that Cold War with successful reductions that have happened as well through various types of treaties subsequent to that. Um, but we are now coming into perhaps a new historical era. The question could be asked, are we coming into a new Cold War period? Um, and how can humanity live? So I'd like to introduce our thinkers this evening, um, which is a great honor to have them here um, and to be able to discuss primarily the nuclear issue, but also the intersectionality with climate change. We have Kenneth Benedict, who is currently the senior advisor for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. For 10 years prior to that, she served as the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin which is a leading magazine about threats to humanity from nuclear weapons, climate change, and emerging technologies. The bulletin is known for the doomsday clock, which measures and gauges these threats, and it currently stands at 100 seconds to midnight. Kinnett publishes articles, gives media interviews about nuclear weapons and disarmament, democracy and the bomb, and global governance. She was the Director of International Peace and Security at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. We have with us here as well, Tara Drozdenko, who's the Acting Executive Director of the Outrider Foundation, which works in both the nuclear weapons and climate change areas. The Outrider Foundation is known for a video on how to dismantle a bomb as well as an online map based tool for understanding the power of these weapons. She has near, nearly two decades of experience in the national security field, managing complex government programs and supervising teams at both the US state and treasury departments. With a degree in uh, plasma physics, she's worked for the US Navy on issues related to weapons of mass destruction and for the U.S. Department State Department, a State Department on nonproliferation and arms control issues. Shane Ward has recently graduated from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, and is already deeply involved in international security and nuclear deterrence work. He was recently elected to the International Student Young Pugwash Executive Board and is currently interning with the Center for Arms Control and Nonproliferation in Washington, DC. While at Bates College, he founded and led the Bates chapter of the United Nations Association and believed strongly in intergovernmental efforts to tackle nuclear proliferation. We do have now a discussion this evening. Um, I will be fielding questions to our three thinkers um, and spurring some of the conversation, but we also hope to take one or two questions if there's time at the end from attendees of this webinar. What I'd like to do then is start in with the discussion for today. And, um, you know, looking at this, I have to confess that. Um, over the past weeks, I've been on a learning curve to really update myself in the current status globally of nuclear weapons. And I thought that it might be useful for us to really just kind of um, touch in on the basic facts of where we are today and what the status is internationally. And I would like to ask uh, one of you if you could help us in that way. Well, I can jump in. Um, the, uh, right now, there are about 13,000 nuclear weapons uh, in nine countries. Um, the US and Russia have about 90% of those weapons, so they are clearly still the leaders in nuclear weapons production. And many of those uh, weapons are on missiles 
that are ready to launch within 15 minutes of a command from the president of a country, the leader of a country. Um, it's a status that people refer to as a, some people refer to as a hair trigger alert. Uh, and in the United States, the president has the sole authority to launch nuclear weapons whenever he or she deems it necessary. Um, as many people I think know, there are increasing tensions there have been between the United States and Russia and the United States and China. So, and there's very, there's less communication between these countries than there has been in the past. I um, might also point to the fraying of treaties. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is um, at risk um, because of, partly because of the Iran deal and North Korea. Um, but I think it's uh, fair to say that many countries believe that um, the US and Russia especially have not uh, been uh, held, uh, uh, um, accepted their responsibility to reduce their nuclear weapons under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, the, I guess the bright note for me, and I hope we'll come back to this, is um, the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which went into force in January of 2021 this year. Um, some people believe it's a kind of uh, very idealistic uh, effort, but uh, it seems to me that it provides an opportunity for us to discuss and talk about what it would mean to prohibit, to outlaw nuclear weapons, rather than allowing some countries to have them and most other countries not. So um, uh, it's a, I think we're at a perilous moment, as you suggested, 100 seconds to midnight on the doomsday clock. Um, it's never been that close to midnight. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult and perilous moment. Uh, and um, I'm hoping that many people will begin to understand that and work to change that. Um, I'm curious also about the power of these weapons today. I remember reading that Hiroshima was, I'm trying to remember, something like 15 kilotons, and yet it killed several hundred thousand people. Um, Tara, I've been to the Outrider website, fascinating tool where you can pick a location globally and you can literally choose the yield as they're using that word in the field, in the nuclear field um, of a weapon and see what the effect is. Um, can you say something about the, the power of today's weapons compared to what we're used to? Uh, yes. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm having a little trouble hearing you and I thought you had finished talking. Um, the bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were equivalent to 15,000 tons of dynamite. Um, that would like, so if you wanted to try to picture that, you could imagine 15,000 pickup trucks filled with a ton of dynamite in each one. Um, the Nagasaki bomb was 20,000 tons of dynamite. So if you kind of put in your mind that 15,000 trucks filled with dynamite that can give you a sense of how big those bombs were. But the bombs that we have today um, in the US and Russia and China are actually much larger, about 20 times larger. Um, and I think it's really hard for um, your brain to even imagine what that level of destruction is. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's important for us to keep in mind. Um, so um, there's the current sort of international situation. Um, Kenneth, you'd mentioned the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is the bright spot on the horizon. Um, I had heard also that uh, right, I think, at the start of the Biden administration, there was the uh, restart of start, if that's the way to put it, um, which was the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, I think it was called. Um, where are we with that today? Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, when the Biden administration came in, they quickly extended for another five years, the New START Treaty. And it's very important because it allows the US and Russia to, uh, to keep track of each other's weapons. 
And there's also talk about um, trying to count warheads, which would be a very different, uh, different procedure. In the past, we've counted delivery vehicles. They're easy to find, missiles, aircraft, uh, submarines. Um, but the, even the Russians seem to be interested in uh, figuring out how many warheads we have and try to keep account of those. And the, 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 the New START Treaty limits how many nuclear weapons each side can have to about 1,500, which isn't low enough. But the, the real advantage of it is that we, uh, each, each country has to report to the other and uh, show what progress they're making in reducing their nuclear weapons. So there, there's, there's communication, there begins to be understanding, and there can also be out of that um, uh, even a, a, a development of new negotiations that might bring those, those numbers down even further, uh, as well as launch readiness, as we say. And again, I'll come back to that. I think the launch readiness, um, the hair trigger alert is really disturbing because um, accidents have happened, can happen. And with new developments in cyber uh, techniques and technology, uh, our command and control systems are vulnerable. Well, how do we back away from that hair trigger status? I know that there's even been books written about how lucky we've been. Yeah. Well, there, there are a couple of um, pieces of legislation actually in the United States that would prohibit the uh, president from launching nuclear weapons unless there was a declaration of war by the Congress, usually in the United States Constitution anyway. Uh, you have to have a declaration of war from Congress before you can launch a war. That's not true these days. The president under the current nuclear policy under the previous administration can launch nuclear weapons um, even in the event of a conventional attack. So um, there is much room for refining and developing a much um, better handle on when these get launched and how. Um, and, and others have said that it's important, and this, these are Senators uh, Warner and Markey, uh, Representative Ted Lieu and Adam Smith have been leading this charge. And uh, I think it's, um, that's a very important piece of what we're doing. Um, the, uh, the other piece that I think you'll wanna talk about too is the modernization program. And that I think is uh, disturbing because even in the face of New START, which is a good idea, uh, the US and Russia seem to be moving forward with building new and improved weapons. They're calling them modernization. And I think that's something that we should, we'll talk about too today. Yeah. I Could I jump in there too about the hair trigger status? Um, not every country that has nuclear weapons has their weapons on hair trigger alert. Um, I know that there's some question about whether or not China is changing its nuclear posture, but historically, they have not had their warheads mated with their delivery vehicles. So it's not, um, it's not the only way to do things, um, is to have hair trigger alert. And other countries have shown us that that's, that's a possibility. I've understood there's discussions with China um, um, with respect to the START Treaty. Is, um, is that true? I think that's true. I, I, I don't, I think they've, they're not all that interested in talking to us until we get our numbers down to 300 or so. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, so I, there's been quite a lot of news recently. Um, you know, China has been discovered to be building, um, I think, up to 200 new missile silos um, out in the desert in, in Gansu and Xinjiang provinces. Um, and that's created a lot of debate. You know, China has traditionally had a very small nuclear arsenal compared to the U.S. and Russia. Um, and the U.S. Has, has failed, certainly under the Trump administration, to bring uh, China into negotiations um, because the Chinese have always said, look at the size of our arsenal compared to yours. Um, it wouldn't be fair. Uh, now, there, there is some thought that um, China, by building up its arsenal, um, you know, would be certainly more open to those negotiations. Um, but China's growth in arsenal is definitely a cause of concern. Um, I think they have the potential to be able to quadruple the size of their arsenal. Um, they, in turn, have concerns about U.S. developments um, in ballistic missile defense. Uh, a smaller arsenal, of course, means that 
there's a better chance that the US could be able to destroy more of their missiles uh, while they're over an exchange, um, which would reduce the effect of their deterrent. And, and all of these pieces fit in really with that, that greater modernization piece you mentioned. Um, it doesn't feel like we're in a new Cold War. Um, you know, there isn't this uh, everyday concern that many people lived through, but um, the truth is all nine nuclear weapon states are, are, are modernizing their nuclear arsenals. Uh, nuclear weapons are getting more powerful, uh, they're getting faster and they're getting more precise. Um, there are worrying developments in hypersonic cruise missiles and nuclear powered cruise missiles, which are better able to evade uh, missile defense systems. Um, and it's not just China, it's not just the US and it's not just Russia. Um, the UK, where I'm from, uh, recently just announced um, its first warhead stockpile increase since the Cold War, uh, a 45% increase in warheads, um, seemingly unprovoked. Um, so on all sides of the table, you have countries building up their nuclear arsenals, um, and yet you have only New START as the, the only agreement which is limiting uh, warheads between any of the nuclear powers. So um, this new spate of modernization is, is really concerning. And... Uh, you know, Cold War. Jane, we are uh, losing you a bit uh, in terms of breaking up, just so you know. Um, but um, I do want to um, circle back around to, we, we've done kind of a situational analysis. I do want to circle back around to that. Um, I, in terms of what can we do? What can anti-proliferation uh, groups do? What effect are um, people like yourselves having, et cetera? Um, but first, I want to touch in a little bit about the intersectionality with climate change, because that seems to be catching a lion's share of the press these days, very little on the nuclear front, other than you might hear something about North Korea or maybe Iran, something like that. But climate change with the weather events is pretty well all over the headlines these days. And um, just curious um, how you see uh, one affecting the other and, and vice versa in terms of uh, global stability these days. Um, if anyone uh, wants to jump I'd, in. <laughs> I'd be happy to jump in. Um, so uh, climate is not a single issue. It's, it's a multitude of issues. It's extreme weather, food insecurity, famine, drought, flooding, loss of biodiversity, sea level rise. It's a bunch of things. Um, and if you take just one of these uh, types of events and you interject it into a community, you get a, a level of insecurity that wasn't there before. Um, and when you layer all of those conditions or a number of those conditions on top of one another, you get even more insecurity. Um, there's a very good argument to be made that the current pandemic is uh, an environmental issue. As, as humans have changed the ecosystem around us and encroached on animal habitats, um, we put ourselves in closer and closer contact with different species that are disease carriers. So it's a crisis of our own making. Um, so it's not surprising that there's an intersection between climate and international security. Um, but the global international order is really a complicated system, just like climate change is complicated. Um, so climate change alone is not going to be what causes a war or even a nuclear war, but um, we see climate change exacerbating um, co existing conflict between countries, just like it exacerbates natural phenomena like floods and drought and hurricanes. So there are places where climate change and the climate crisis is colliding with nuclear issues. Um, and I can give a few examples of those if you'd like. Um, one is the region of Kashmir. Um, this is a region that's been a source of conflict between India and Pakistan, both nuclear armed nations um, for more than 70 years. And uh, they fought two major wars and even a small regional uh, war over this area. Um, and as recently as two years ago, India put the region under martial law. So. Um, where does climate change in come into this? Um, several major rivers flow from India into Pakistan through Kashmir. And there's a treaty, uh, the Indus Water Treaty of 1960, where India and Pakistan agree to share these resources. But climate change and growing populations are putting more pressure on the demand for water. 
Um, and so a while back after militants attacked an Indian army base in Kashmir in 2016, um, India declared that it planned to speed up construction of dams in Kashmir, um, which would affect Pakistan's water supply. And then Pakistan in turn uh, warned that if India acted against the treaty, it would be an act of war. So this is a kind of an example where you've got um, the impact on water resources due to climate change, exacerbating conflict between two nuclear armed nations. I can give other examples if you want. Um, that's an example of how those issues are colliding, but there's also, um, if I can just talk for a little bit more and go back to this modernization idea, um, the U.S. is set to spend close to $2 million over the next 30, or $2 trillion over the next 30 years to rebuild and replace our entire nuclear arsenal. And within our Congress, there just aren't a lot of objections to this course of action. I mean, there is a few. You've got Barbara Lee and Elizabeth Warren and Mark Pocan, and, but there's not very many. Um, yet when the Senate recently passed this $1 trillion infrastructure package, suddenly the debate was about how this level of spending was irresponsible and there was no historic precedent for it. Um, so what does, I mean, what does that mean for a society when we say that nuclear weapons are worth spending money on but our infrastructure is not worth the investment. And, and just like to clarify, the infrastructure bill includes things like investing in public transit and uh, expanding passenger rail and modernizing our electrical grid and investing in electric vehicle infrastructure. And all those things are necessary for the US to make a clean energy transition and get our carbon emissions under control. Um, and we know that climate change is not affecting all communities uh, the same. And here in the US, communities that have less wealth and less political power, which are often communities of color, are more severely impacted by climate. Um, they are hit harder by extreme weather. The health outcomes are worse for folks in those communities and those health outcomes are directly tied to carbon emissions. So when we're having a debate in the US about investing in clean energy future and how it's too expensive, but our nuclear weapons are not too expensive, it's very obvious that we are prioritizing the safety and security of some Americans more than the safety and security of other Americans. And we are picking and choosing who gets to be secure. Um, and those choices are outcomes of structural and institutional racism. Um, so that's sort of another, another way that, uh, that the climate and nuclear um, issues kind of collide there as well. You haven't even touched in on uranium mining and um... Yeah. yeah, there's other areas of, of environmental injustice as well that are parallel in both of the climate and nuclear debates. And, and uh, that's all absolutely true. And Robert, I just wanted to touch uh, as well on um, other solutions to climate change. Um, many people point to the possibility of building many more nuclear power plants in order to address, uh, reduce our uh, carbon emissions and, and have enough electricity. And um, the problem here is that we really don't have a way of dealing with our uh, fuel enrichment cycle in a way that doesn't permit proliferation of more nuclear weapons. So civilian nuclear power may actually lead to, a in, in order to address climate change as a solution, might in fact lead to a proliferation, a building of more nuclear weapons, uh, not only in the nine nuclear weapon states, but could be um, in other countries as well. And of course, that's what the Iran uh, situation is all about. They would like to develop nuclear power. And uh, we say, wait a minute, the enrichment cycle um, also can produce nuclear weapons. So we need to you know, figure out how we're going to control this. Uh, but Iran is not the only country that would like to do that. And um, as people propose nuclear power as a solution, we need to be mindful of the, of, um, the problem of, of actually increasing our insecurity with more nuclear weapon states. So it literally is a double-edged sword then, you could say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. for bombs. Mm -hmm. Um, Jane, I, I wanted to turn to you here for a moment. Um, 
you're a recent graduate, I understand, um, but you seem to be very active, very involved in this field. And congratulations, by the way, on being elected to the board of the International Student Young Pugwash. Um, I'm sure that's going to uh, clearly bring you more into an international setting when I look at uh, who's going to be on the new board and so on. I'm really glad you could join us. Um, and you're working, as I understand it, uh, intergovernmentally, um, UK, you're from the UK originally, um, based in, the, in, at least in school in the US and now working as an intern. Um, how do you see that playing out between sort of the cross Atlantic? Uh, we've got the two major superpowers, the US and Russia, as Kanet was saying, well, probably what, 85, 90% of the weaponry on the planet, but then you've also got the UK. You've got France, you've got Israel, um, maybe not as much on a hair trigger status, um, but they are definitely nuclear powers playing in the field. Um, so any comments in terms of what you've seen um, and what might be placed forward there? I'm sorry, I missed the last, the last part of that. Any comments on what you've seen and, and what might be ways, good ways forward in terms of um, working in uh, the security field? I still miss a lot. I'm very sorry. Yeah, something seems to be amiss with my mic. Um, so any comments on, the, on what you've learned so far in your work as an intern? Yeah, so I think um, one of the interesting things about working in, um, you know, in the U.S. as a, as a non-U.S. citizen and, and being exposed to um, the U.S. national security and the U.S. defense space um, is really how is how interconnected and how important uh, allies are in, um, in in these decision making. We talk we've talked a lot about the U.S. Um, and uh, what's going on in Congress and, and and that huge amount of nuclear spending, um, but that is all really tied together with um, everything that goes on within NATO, um, within the UK in particular. So um, that's where I focused a lot of my work. Um, the UK itself as well, uh, as I said, modernizing its nuclear arsenal. Uh, it leans heavily on the US uh, and it has pushed the US quite heavily over the last year um, for the development of this new warhead, uh, the W93, which would be the, the first new US nuclear weapon um, since the Cold War, if, if the funding is approved. Um, so we see in these conversations, you know, um, a real, um, a real connection um, and a real uh, reliance um, on allies, uh, and that's something that uh, you appreciate more. I think um, the UK certainly flies under the radar uh, very intentionally when it comes to um, nuclear weapons, um, and that's something that uh, becomes more obvious and the, the importance of those allies um, when you come to the US. Uh, you talked as well about the, the UN Prohibition Treaty, um, as we know. Uh, no, none of the nuclear weapon states have signed the treaty. Uh, NATO itself uh, and all of the allies uh, under the U.S. nuclear umbrella in East Asia, they refute the treaty. Um, even states like Canada, uh, who don't have nuclear weapons, they are seen to be quite progressive on these sort of issues. Um, and, and that comes down again to the importance of allies um, and the transatlantic sphere um, in dealing with these conversations. Uh, that's something I think you appreciate more. Um, I, I think... Uh, more people should certainly, uh, you know, be exposed to those conversations and realize that, uh, you know, yes, the U.S. and Russia are, are the two big players in this, um, but those those so-called second-tier nuclear weapon states um, are just as important in in, uh, in in this driving force of modernization um, and and in this movement towards this new Cold War. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question on on kind of the personal side of things. I'm happy to be to talk more about. Um, you know, why I've been involved in this and, and my interest in that from a youth, youth perspective as well. Um, I do want to circle back around to that. And, you know, you did mention Canada. And yes, we have not signed the treaty. I understand that there was a poll um, in uh, the past year or so where some 85 percent of Canadians wanted us to sign the treaty. Uh, but that uh, may or may not happen. And, you know, Canada has a history in decades past of being a peacekeeper internationally on the stage uh, with various conflicts. 
um, going on in different parts of the world and troops coming in and a peacekeeping mission. Uh, and even in uh, 1997, uh, through what they call the Ottawa process, um, invitation of groups coming together, uh, nations coming together, and they very successfully signed a treaty on banning landmines, uh, which were quite a problem uh, back then, and that was quite successful. So we do have that history, and um, you know, it's it, there is certainly some um, uh, potential. We've got an election coming up. Uh, there might be some changes. Who knows on um, where Canada stands. Uh, at least in terms of its position and, and how it may uh, communicate that. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to, to ask, um, it strikes me that there's a lot of people working in the anti-proliferation area. Um, we've got uh, Kinnett, uh, as you know, with the Bulletin, uh, the Outrider Foundation, the Center for Arms Control, there's Plowshares, there's a whole lot of groups working in this area. Pugwash, of course, um, has a long history there. Um, to what extent would you say um, that work by these groups has um, had an impact on arms control, arms reduction, um, diplomacy, and really easing that tension? Uh, well, Robert, let me start uh, just briefly. Um, uh, in the past, certainly these organizations have. And when I was at the MacArthur Foundation in the in the late in the in the 90s, uh, we did play a role in uh, reducing tensions between the U.S. and Russia and supporting Russian science, actually, and intellectuals there. And also the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which you mentioned had brought down the nuclear arsenals of these two countries from something like 60,000 nuclear weapons down to, oh, about, I don't know, 10 or, or, or 11,000. So um, in 20 years, they managed to reduce them. And through the help of um, support from some foundations and then the uh, government funding from the United States, it certainly was very successful. Um, I'd say the recent work of uh, groups like Plowshares were very helpful in getting the Iran deal signed during the Obama administration. Um, and there's been ongoing work with North Korea. But of course, you get a new administration that has different ideas and um, uh, sometimes things collapse. So I think we're, um, we're hoping that with new energy and new administration that more progress can be made. But um, it, it's, it's fair to say it's pretty much, uh, I think at this point, an uphill battle. I know that groups are focused on the budget um, as um, both uh, Tara and Shane have talked about um, putting money into nuclear weapons when we have so many other pressing needs seems a little bit strange, let's put it that way. And I think um, uh, the public and uh, congressional leaders in the United States, I think, are seeing the wisdom of um, focusing more on uh, other needs besides nuclear weapons. But we'll see. It's um, uh, many groups are working, not enough. We need more. I hope that call goes out clearly that we need many more people to focus on the nuclear weapons issues. So with that focus on those issues, where uh, are the most gains to be made? Is it helping with diplomacy, with um, uh, getting the discussions in earnest about different kinds of treaties, uh, working through the political tensions? Um, where where uh, do people usually try to focus? Well, in my experience, we've, you know, people focus in different places. Um, professional and expert to policy people can uh, uh, educate and inform co congressional members in the United States and Canada and elsewhere. Pugwash has been great over the years in bringing scientific and expert information to leaders, political leaders in many countries around the world, and they continue to do that. Um, I... Um, I've been uh, starting to get involved in the idea of supporting uh, resolutions to support the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Um, the US Conference of Mayors has passed a resolution. Uh, Los Angeles has, Calif the state of California has. Um, I'm gonna be testifying in Chicago um, at the beginning of September um, to pass a resolution there. 
And, you know, it, it seems idealistic, but the point is to get people talking about nuclear weapons. Um, we don't, they're not in front of us. We need a vehicle for discussion in the public. We need a vehicle for demanding that the veil of secrecy be lifted about nuclear weapons and nuclear policy. And this is one avenue that I think some people have been interested in. Um, so uh, that's something that folks can do for young people. Global Zero has been a really important organization. And uh, so there are others, but I think um, not enough, obviously, um, but certainly um, we need to do what we can to get this on the, on the front burner again. So that's a good segue, uh, Kanet, on um, really wanting to try to focus in on what can we do. Mm -hmm. Center for Local Prosperity, we try to bring things back home to the local level, to the community level. These are obviously big, hairy global issues, big threats. Uh, can seem overwhelming very easily. But how do we bring that down to the community level, to the individual level? What can people actually do? Um, and, um, and, you know, it's a good question. Where do, where do we start? Where do young people start? Where do students start? Where does a community group start uh, in terms of um, getting involved and, and trying to do something? Shane, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the, the youth part, certainly. But um, I think as, as a starting point, both for, for the younger generation um, and, and older generations, uh, the most important thing, I think, uh, as, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, is, is really just to get educated about these issues. Um, the, the climate crisis has, you know, dominated the news for, for some time now. Um, but the, the nuclear crisis certainly flies under the radar a lot more. Uh, I think many of my peers certainly, you know, they, they have some knowledge about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but far too few people um, of all ages know really anything about the potential destruction of nuclear weapons that still exists today. Uh, you know, young people did not grow up in the Cold War. They don't remember that day-to-day -day fear of living under, um, under nuclear weapons. Uh, and so they haven't been exposed to it. I think uh, unlike climate change as well, um, young people in particular tend to think that they can't have an impact in the field. Um, the community is definitely smaller. Uh, it's less grassroots. Um, it can feel very niche at times, um, even being within it. Uh, the language can seem you know, technical and confusing. Um, but, you know, you don't need an understanding of, of nuclear physics, of, of how nuclear weapons work to uh, take an interest in, in the potential devastation that they can cause um, and get involved. I think the, the power of young people um, has really been demonstrated well in the climate movement. Um, young people like Greta Thunberg ha have really led that fight. And, and there's a lot to learn from the climate movement um, and transfer into the, the nuclear movement as well. Um, without detracting from the importance of the climate movement, that young people um, can really have an impact. Um, leaders will be forced to listen to young people. Um, and everyone, young and old, has a stake in these issues. Um, you know, the climate crisis and the nuclear crisis really have a symbiotic relationship. Um, they're both critical um, to all generations. And that can start through um, getting involved in organizations like Pugwash, um, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, um, and of course, through your regular advocacy and, and lobbying routes as well, um, without going too much on, uh, uh, on here, you know, this is the, um, we're expecting this year, um, the Biden administration's first nuclear posture review, uh, which will shape nuclear weapon policies um, for the years ahead. Uh, funding right now is under review for the next um, years of nuclear weapons funding. So now is really the time, um, particularly in the U.S., um, to make a difference. And, and those avenues which young people uh, and other people uh, have made a difference in the climate movement still uh, ring true here, uh, not just in terms of uh, funding for nuclear weapons, but on policy issues like no first use, um, presidential sole authority, um, signing and ratifying the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, um, things which Kenneth touched on earlier. So um, I think it at the end of the day, it, it really starts with education um, and realizing that this is not an inaccessible field um, and it has a lot of parallels with the climate movement and there's a lot to learn from it. So it sounds like um, um, in addition to education, which is an important first start, I think, particularly around the nuclear issue, because um, um, it not, it's not that present. Um, I think people of all ages really don't know kind of the nuts and bolts of the status right now. Uh, but in addition to education, um, 
if I hear what you're saying, it's really getting involved in the um, kind of the advocacy piece, working with local governments, national governments, um, advocating for a uh, better policy, a better stance, um, as opposed to, let's say, uh, picking up a placard, going out, uh, protesting on the street, that sort of thing, which we, of course, see a lot of on the climate change front. Is that um, more what you're suggesting? Um, as I, I think that they're both important routes. And I think, you know, the, the climate movement does that as well. Um, advocacy is, is naturally really important. Um, our decision makers, our elected decision makers, are the ones making these decisions, are the ones approving the funding. Um, so they absolutely need to be held accountable. Um, for young people, you know, uh, direct protest um, and getting involved in organizations like, like ICANN, like Pugwash, um, is also really important. I, and that's really important, I think, in raising awareness in the general public um, and spreading kind of how important this is. Um, so I don't think the two are necessarily in contrast. I think they go hand in hand with each other. Um, they both have an effect in different ways. One is really about raising awareness and, and getting the issue in the public eye. Um, the other is about holding elected officials who have some sway over these issues, uh, you know, accountable for their actions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Tara, Kinnett, anything to add to that um, in terms of what people can do? Well, I, um, I, I think that both um, Shane and and Kenneth have mentioned uh, some really good uh, ways to get involved. And in particularly with the advocacy, there are, uh, just in case people don't know, there are very specific recommendations for policy changes that would incrementally move uh, the US in particular towards a safer um, stance on nuclear weapons. So Kenneth mentioned, and I think both Shane mentioned um, a no first use policy, um, questions about the president's sole authority, taking weapons off hair trigger alert. These are things that the US could do that would incrementally move us into a safer um, space when it, when it comes to our nuclear posture. But ultimately, long-term, we need to rethink uh, the importance of nuclear weapons in our security uh, paradigm. Um, and the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is a, a radical paradigm shift for that. And, and that, what that treaty says is that we don't need nuclear weapons to, to manage our international relationships. Um, we don't need to rely on them to be secure and safe. And so that, that ultimately needs to be where we get to with these incremental changes. Um, and so, yeah, I just think supporting uh, those particular policy prescriptions as well as advocating to um, local officials the importance of, of um, shifting our, sec our security perspective so that we are no longer relying on nuclear weapons as the core of our security policy. You know, this word security keeps popping up. It's baked into a lot of the work that you do. And uh, we talked about this earlier. I'm, I'm given to a quote by Albert Einstein uh, which might be appropriate, Tara, you invoked uh, COVID there in terms of one of the intersectionalities and, and instabilities that it can cause in society. Einstein said that nationalism is an infantile disease. It's the measles of mankind. And I can see that a lot of this is driven by nationalism, that kind of turf protection, that's really baked into the word security, us and them mentality. Um, and so it's, in some ways, you could say it's a virus of nationalism. Mm. And, you know, to keep going in that direction, where do we find a vaccine? Uh, we're going to make it timely here. Um, in other words, how do we live with this threat? Um, you know, this is, I'm looking at some of the questions coming in. Uh, both climate change and uh, the nuclear threat are both human caused. It's caused by um, nationalism by nations driven by only a few people at the top, um, usually not listening to their populace. Um, so how do we uh, go forward? Um, it's hard to imagine nuclear weapons are going to go away. We can reduce them. We can remove hair trigger status. Um, we can try and be as diplomatic as we can. And hopefully we'll be lucky. Um, 
But I'm thinking, how do we live with this? We've been 76 years at it now. We've been very fortunate. Um, any thoughts um, on the future and how, how do we adapt to a world with a nuclear threat? Well, Robert, with all due respect, I don't think we can live with this. I think we will die with nuclear weapons if we don't do something to radically reduce their role in our foreign policy and national security policy. And I think um, we, yes, we have been lucky. Um, you know, we used to think that, uh, some people used to think that uh, slavery couldn't be abolished either. Um, and yet we were able to do it. The women shouldn't have the vote. That, you know, there have been big changes, paradigm shifts in culture and in politics in the past. And we thought it couldn't happen. We didn't think the Soviet Union would fall. We thought that would go on forever. So there are times when things have shifted and um, we're, I'm never, we're never quite sure what all it takes, but it takes persistence, hard work. It takes lobbying, it takes educating. Um, it takes showing the economic interests that people may have that are different from what the current uh, uh, policies are. But I don't think we can live with it, frankly. I think we have to address it, um, reduce even further the nuclear weapons, um, develop a, an emphasis on what people call human security rather than national security. And you know that was in part the basis of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was to understand that humans are the ones who need to be secure, not necessarily nations. So I don't, I, 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 I see the direction of your question, but I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I guess make us all accountable and to, to, to understand that it's, I'm not sure it's possible that we can live with them. Yeah. I'm, I'm with Kenneth on this. Um, nuclear, a nuclear detonation or a nuclear launch is what people call a um, low probability, high risk event. It It's not likely to happen, but the longer that we have them, the more the chance increases that it will happen. And the consequences of a um, nuclear war are un inconceivable, really. Um, and if you look at things, how our hospitals are flooded because of the pandemic, uh, think of that happening instantaneously almost. They, they, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, I, they have a wonderful way of putting this. Uh, if you had one, just one city attacked, um, the vast majority of survivors would have third degree burns. There aren't enough hospital beds in all of the United States to treat that many um, burn victims. So we just don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. Um, so I don't think we can live with it. I'm with Kenneth on this. I think our goal has to be elimination. Um, and that seems impossible, but I think that we can't live without doing that. So we really have a job on our hands to raise awareness and get it out there. Somebody just wrote in a question um, that I mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of a national election in Canada. And should we be putting that question to all the local candidates of what is their stance on both the nuclear and the climate emergencies? Absolutely. They, they probably have a canned response on the climate emergency, I would guess. Uh, but it, you know, to really push the boundary and ask them about a nuclear emergency. And see Absolutely. What yeah, I think you should. I think too often politicians don't get asked a question about nuclear weapons. And so they they are under the impression that their constituents don't really care. And so they can do whatever they want about nuclear weapons or whatever they think is best. And the only way to disabuse them of that notion is to ask them about what they think about nuclear weapons and to let them know that their constituents do care. Yeah. So it's everybody pushing uh, the back that way. Uh, it looks like we might've lost Shane. Oh, dear. Um, oh there, he there he is. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm glad you're back in. That's good. So it really then does come down to that sort of level of activism, education first, activism second. Um, anytime there's an opportunity like that with a politician uh, writing letters, advocacy, 
Um, but I, I, my feeling is it's the education piece is probably the most important because it's just not front and center in most people's minds. It's buried way in the background. It's not talked about by the media hardly at all. Mm -hmm. um, and people don't, as you were saying, Shane, uh, younger generations have never had to live through this. I'm old enough to remember uh, back in the Cold War days of the 60s when it was you know, public emergency response. It was being talked about quite a bit. Um, but that's when it was still a new threat. And we've kind of got used to it at some level along the way uh, as a culture, as a society. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, I agree that uh, education is really, really the key. So let me ask the three of you, what is your motivation? What drives you working in this field? Why do you go the extra mile? <laughs> well, I'll start. I'll start. I'm the old one in the group. So I'll start. Um, I, I actually was quite, um, inspired, really, by my work with uh, with Russians at the end of the Cold War and and looking at how, in fact, we could reduce nuclear risk. And um, being involved in that, um, you know, with Senator Nunn and Senator Lugar and um, helping on the edges as a funder to uh, move that forward, uh, doing the, uh, supporting the research and the theoretical underpinnings of cooperative threat reduction uh, in, the, in the 80s and early 90s, it really inspired me. I thought, wow, you know, maybe we can do something about this. Um, I had also participated as a high school kid in um, nuclear disarmament vigils in the, at the University of Chicago. So there was a little bit of a background there, but, um, and we've seen how in fact, protests and citizen involvement can make a difference. Um, the second is that um, uh, the field of nuclear security is, uh, woefully devoid of women. <laughs> and um, I felt that as a woman, I needed to encourage other women and also to step up myself and to be part of the solution to this problem, um, as hard as that can be sometimes. So uh, the challenge of um, kind of getting my way into the discussions um, and then the inspiration I, I, I felt from seeing uh, success. And I think that's what got me involved. Thank you, thank you. Tara, I'm curious as well, you've got a good track record work, working with different uh, government departments. And in your- yeah. story, uh, <laughs> I don't think my, uh, I don't think my story is as, um, I don't know, as idealized as, as um, Kenneth's. I, I kind of fell into the field, to be honest. Um, I wanted to, I was, when I was studying physics, I wanted to do something that that had something to do with science policy and international relations. That's all I knew. And then I headed out to DC and when you have a, a technical degree like physics or some, or engineering, you get pushed into weapons work. That's just where they put you. Um, and so that's how I ended up there. I was very uncomfortable with the um, I worked for the Navy for a while and then we invaded Iraq and I got really uncomfortable with my job doing bomb damage assessments and watching Iraq's infrastructure crumble. And I said, I need a different job <laughs> um, and ended up at the State Department in the Arms Control Bureau. Um, and that is sort of what set me on this path. Um, it was a little bit accidental and happenstance, but I am very fulfilled and, and glad that this is what I'm working on. Um, and what keeps me going is um, just a hope that we we could figure out a better way to do things, that we could care for the poor in our country, um, and make sure that 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 we're addressing injustice and um, tackling the climate crisis, um, and relying less on nuclear weapons as part of our uh, our security posture. So that's what keeps me going. And Shane, please, how about you? Yeah, I mean, naturally, I'm, I'm much newer to the field. Um, I've really only been um, interested in the, in the topic for a little over a year now. Um, but I agree with, with Tara that I think uh, myself and a lot of people kind of fall into this field. I don't think 
anyone is really born with a you know a huge interest or like desire to work in in arms control and nuclear policy. Um, I had long held an interest in climate issues. I think a lot of young people do. They're kind of unavoidable um, for good reason. Um, they feel like such a definitive and, and generational challenge. And as we've seen this summer, we see their effects uh, really daily. Um, and I kind of came across nuclear, uh, nuclear policy and nuclear non-proliferation very much by accident um, through, a, through a connection as I was looking at grad schools. Um, and I joined this wonderful uh, kind of networking community um, called the Nuclear Fusion Project. Um, and, uh, you know, I, once I was immersed in this community of, of I think it's, it's a very small community, um, but it's full of brilliant, passionate, um, kind people. Uh, it's a really great community. It's not at all, um, you know, niche or, um, or anything like it might seem from the outside. Um, and as I, as I learn more about these issues, I think the magnitude of the challenge um, that we face in terms of this nuclear crisis really just stuck with me. Um, to take nothing away from the climate fight, this was a much smaller community. Um, it felt like it didn't have the coverage that it deserved. Um, and I really wanted to be a part of that and to you know, help grow it and expose it um, to young people um, and just in generally. So I, I don't have um, this amazing backstory of how I came into it, but I, I don't think you really have to. Um, we're all affected by it, whether we know it or not. Um, and even if we're not affected by it right now, um, you don't have to be to, to take a stand on something which is a really important part of our future. So, Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all three of you for your energy and your inspiration of all the conversations that we've had um, in this webinar. Um, we are just about out of time. I want to encourage listeners, uh, please sign up for our newsletter to stay abreast of what uh, is coming up. Um, we also, uh, as part of interviewing the thinkers for the upcoming summit, we just released a feature article on climate grief uh, on our website. Please uh, take a look at that. Uh, there will be other feature interviews uh, coming up as well. Uh, and we have two more webinars, one on September 7th, um, entitled Our Global Climate, Our Human Prospect. Um, and then one on September 13th about the bringing these global realities into the classroom. And if you're inspired, uh, it's greatly helpful uh, making a donation to help us continue this work. If you're in Canada, uh, we can provide a tax receipt. I would like to thank everyone for attending this evening. And uh, please stay tuned and plug into future uh, events. Thank you. Thank you.